Well, welcome everyone to, uh, to Code D's meeting. So we are Code D, Computational Design Detroit. And we're really excited because today we're finally presenting Rhino Inside. I know a lot of people have heard about Rhino Inside, are curious about it. And we think that it's a very relevant topic for our industry as we're all racing to learn Dynamo or Grasshopper, one or the other, both, no one's really sure. Um, and then Rhino Inside shows up, which allows us the ability to use Rhino and Grasshopper inside of Revit. And we think that's a, a big deal. So today um, we'll be going through that. So by means of introduction, um, I am Leland Curtis uh, with Smith Group. I'll let the, uh, the other guys from the planning committee introduce themselves. Oh, you might be muted. Yeah, you're muted. I'll, I'll go next. I'm Nicola and I'm with uh, HKS Architects. I'm Az Azubike uh, with Inform Studio. I think John was trying to join. John, I think your phone may be muted. Hey, Ramon, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, while well, John is waiting, uh, this is, uh, I'm Ramon Corpus uh, with Smith Group. John, you are unmuted. Oh, thanks. I'm uh, John McGarry from Newman Smith. Great. Uh, so yeah, the, the group of us here, we've uh, collected um, several examples that we're going to share with you. Um, before we get that started, uh, we're kind of curious who all has attended. So um, what do you say we try out that poll feature? Uh, Lauren, can you start that, that poll that we worked on before? Here we go. All right, everybody should be able to see a poll pop up on their screen. Fantastic. As we move virtual, obviously, we have technical issues, right? This is kind of an awkward, weird... Uh, format. Um, we prefer to do these meetings uh, as we have in the past every quarter. For those of you who haven't been able to join us, um, we are trying to be, Code D is trying to be a forum for the Detroit area and really anyone who's interested to join the conversation about what computational design means for our industry and for us as, as individuals. Um, so to that end, uh, if you wouldn't mind all just filling out this poll, we're curious who, um, who you all are joining uh, and what our crowd is today. Right? Are you all architects? Are you all students? Combo of both. And especially, I think it'll be relevant to the future uh, uh, forum that we have after our presentation, we'll get into a uh, discussion on certain prompts. Um, understanding who in this audience uses Grasshopper versus Dynamo might, uh, might be useful. So um, yeah, please fill out that poll um, and we'll, we'll see what kind of people we have on the call. Just waiting on a couple of folks at this point. I'll give you guys an another few seconds to answer the questions, assuming that you all can see this and participate. All right, I am going to end the polling and share the results. All right. Nearly all architects, one engineer, lonely engineer, professor, all right. I'm curious what the others are. Great, interesting, very, very interesting. Um, I'm checking out the, uh... all right. A lot of people who haven't used either Dynamo or Grasshopper, perfect. Uh, we wanna make sure that this, uh, this group, uh, although we try to talk about advanced topics and we do have, uh, I would consider, uh, expert computational designers as part of this community. Uh, in many ways, this, this group is meant for everyone who's just now learning. Uh, so this is fantastic to see that a lot of people joining um, haven't yet or, or just interested in learning uh, Grasshopper or Dynamo. Um, hopefully, by the time we're done with this call, you'll be even more interested. Um, trying to encourage you to do it. Very cool, very cool. Well, um, without further ado, uh, what do you say? Uh, Zuby, do you want to kick us off and give us a sense of what Rhino Inside is? Let's, let's do just that. I'm going to share my screen. While Zuby is sharing his screen, I just want to let all the attendees know that if they want continuing education for this event, if they have the ability to make sure that their first and last name are showing up um, 
so that I can identify them for the continuing education reporting purposes, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, I will be messaging you privately through the chat to get your, your information. Thanks. All right, with that, uh, welcome guys. Uh, any of you have heard about Rhino inside? It's like, what is this thing? But really, uh, just to give you a brief uh, description of what it is before we get into it, Rhino inside is pretty much an open source uh, project uh, by McNeil and Associates, the guys responsible for Rhino, uh, that allows Rhino and Grasshopper pretty much run into uh, inside, that's where the name came from, inside any 64-bit uh, window application. So Revit is one of those applications, CAD is one of those applications, Illustrator. So think about how for those of you who use Revit, you think of IDE as a plugin. So Rhino and Grasshopper and everything that comes with that becomes a plugin in Revit and any other software. I think that's just mind-blowing. And what that allows you to do is pretty much you know, modify, um, use Rhino and Grasshopper to modify the host object. So I can use Rhino Grasshopper to modify uh, Revit objects, um, since that will be the focus of, of uh, meeting today. Um, and then you can go back and forth. So modify Rhino using Revit, like it's, it's pretty uh, awesome. But it's work in progress, um, so a lot of, there are a lot of kinks and even with the startup. So I'm just going to go through like, oh, so you download the files. What's your first experience like on the interface? Um, if you see my screen, uh, your file should typically, like when you boot up Revit, you typically would have your, uh, your menus. And when you go to add them, you will see a Rhino, uh, after you install, there's a Rhino with uh, button. You just click on that button and it shows, it should automatically show you a new tab where you have the Rhinoceros uh, tab, the Grasshopper tab, and the uh, sample files. So there's also resources here to kind of help you navigate uh, what is this thing and more information on where you can learn um, um, on how to use it. Uh, for this today, we're going to be getting into the grasshopper side of things. So I'm just going to put up uh, grasshopper real quick. And the, what I'll be presenting is pretty much how to manipulate Revit geometry uh, using uh, grasshopper and leveraging some of grasshopper's data control features. Um, I think that's, that's pretty uh, remarkable. So real quick, I'm going to uh, open up my file, which I can and automatically you see that it creates a wall. Now, I'll show some of this file, but I don't want you to get super focused on the nodes that I'm using to work with. It's more of the control. The only thing I have here is Grasshopper and Rhino. And you know, before I even get a bit ahead of myself, what does opening Rhino look like? Like you would notice, I have Rhino open here. Now, I don't have Rhino as a um, software running. I only have Revit running. And so that's why you notice in the Revit icon on my taskbar, it's showing both Revit and Rhino. But in my Rhino, which is somewhere here, it's not open. The other interesting thing is I can just like, you know, take out any view and pretty much close Rhino. So I have my view from Rhino, but Rhino is closed. Um, that's just phenomenal. Um, so right now, I don't necessarily need that. Uh, what I want to do is go ahead and start you know, building walls. So, well, I have uh, different controls here that modify my wall, um, and I'm dealing with it. So think about this as a prefabricated panel or a facade, right? And I have different bay counts, so I can make that, you know, one, two, three. Um, interestingly, I can change the floor count, you know, at this goal though. Um, and the other interesting thing is, this can interact with 
Revit geometry that we put in there. So I'm just going to put, draw a wall. Let's see what that was. I'll go back to 3D view. Um, and modify my, my wall count for it. Good. You notice there's no relationship right now, but I can align this top for those of you who are familiar with Revit and lock it, right? The moment I start to adjust my floor count, it adjusts the wall. So I'm interacting with Revit through Grasshopper, but I'm also allowing, or it also allows me to also embed some of those uh, features from Revit that lets me lock elements. So I can interact with elements from the Grasshopper end just like it's a Revit element. So I click on that wall, it's, it's an actual wall. Um, and it's allowed me to control a wall that I did not create in Grasshopper. So I think that's, that's also pretty uh, phenomenal. So what if we want to add levels? So I have this control, which Grasshopper just nicely allows me to um, add a button. Uh, I'll show you the code afterwards, but what this is, is, is calling out. Um, so I have my levels drawn out here. So as I start to adjust my floor, you will notice that it's all of this is happening in Grasshopper and I'm creating levels. Um, so documentation is starting to happen. I'm trying to set up my model from Grasshopper in a way that will help me down the line to create other elements that may not be created in Grasshopper but in, in, in Revit. Um, the next thing we'll do is, all right, say we want to place uh, windows, right? So maybe I should increase my, my deep count and place windows. So this is from a project that we did at Inform Studio where we had like a bay on every 25 feet connected to the grid. And uh, it's the LTU building site, so pretty much just creating the same thing. So if we place windows, what this is doing, in fact, I think I can adjust my parapet height. There we go. Um, what this is doing is it's also allowing me to place families. So I created this family in Revit, but I have the control to place it and also modify it. Um, so you will notice that when I click here, it is actually placing at a seal height of three. That's because my seal height here is three. When I start to adjust this, let's make it maybe 2.5. All of a sudden, CS 2.6. That's, that's all happening through Grasshopper. Um, and what else, what else can we do here? An interesting thing we can do that I noticed is that I can start to set up, setting up a camera view. All like Dynamo, which I'm not trying to shoot Dynamo, but I can now control my geometry in perspective. For those of you who use Dynamo, you know you can only control Dynamo certain views. Uh, so as I adjust my flow count, well, I'm, I'm able to modify this in perspective to also get a sense of what's happening. Something else you can do. What if you want to modify this window, the parameters of this window? Well, I have a flying man who will help me do just that. So there's that. I'm going to use the MD slider, which lets me, again, this is another personal control for those people who don't use Grasshopper that lets me modify things in two axes. Uh, so I'm just going to move that UI here. This is all happening. It's almost like it's flying. But what I want is I want to use this guy to adjust parameters of the window. So any window, the closer the, the, the window is to him, the more open the window gets. So uh, let me launch that. But let's maybe go to another view where we can appreciate this. All right, that's our guy. I'm going to modify this. 
and it takes a little bit of time for it to regenerate um, as I do this. But you notice that the windows around here will start to change. There we go. So now I'm going to move him all the way to here. Takes a little bit of time to to generate. So you don't necessarily have to have it right link. You can make a modification um, and show it on the right hand side. But when you feel like you're at a good point, then you can uh, push it to ready. So it's just taking a little bit of time there. There you go. So he's acting as an attractive point, is that essentially. And as I position him, um, I start to see uh, changes in my facade, all happening through Grasshopper. But maybe I want to, you know, create, you notice this levels that came from Revit are blue, and that's because um, Revit has this set up as plan views. So what if I want to make these views that I have uh, plan views? Well, if you notice here, I don't have them, but again, with a custom code because again, all of these nodes, which I should still you know, create, just don't forget to do that. These are the nodes on my screen. For those of you familiar with Grasshopper, um, this is like the Revit plug in inside Grasshopper that lets you, you know, create nodes that you need to create your script. Okay. Um, so with that said, I was able to create a custom node because what Rhino Inside allows you to do is um, also create custom uh, operations using the Revit API. Essentially, you can write your own command um, and run that inside inside Grasshopper through Python or C Sharp for those of you who are advanced in, in coding. So this this is unique in that there is no node. Uh, in Revit that lets you create a plan view for levels. But I wrote that real quick and notice that when I click on it, all of a sudden I have plan views from one, two, three, relative to my level. I think you notice that my guy is here. Um, so that is essentially um, ways that you can you know, start to tweak uh, objects in, in I, I kind of have had fun with this guy. Ways you, you can tweak objects in, in Revit uh, using using Rhino inside. And so with that, I literally would uh, turn it over to uh, uh, John. Uh, Zuby, before we before we move on, um, we had a question um, from oh, Anusha yeah. uh, asking about how exactly the windows were created. She said, um, "So the models are did we model the windows in Grasshopper and loaded them as components in Revit? Um, can you describe exactly how the window geometry was created?" Fantastic. So the window geometry itself was created as a Revit family or a standard Revit window family from scratch in Revit. But then I was able to access that file and apply it to certain locations through Grasshopper. Hopefully that answered the question. And if anyone has questions as we go, there's actually a nice Q&A panel within Zoom that mm -hmm. makes it very easy to, um, to track the different questions. So as opposed to typing questions in the chat window, feel free to, to ask them in the Q&A panel. Otherwise, I'm turning it to John. Thanks, Zuby. Let me uh, share my screen really quick. All right. So during these crazy, unprecedented times, uh, Newman Smith, we've been helping a, a lot of our clients out on uh, rearranging spaces, making sure the spaces comply with social distancing standards. And, um, and a lot of that's just with workstations and, and seating arrangements. Um, so I was asked to, uh, if we could automate this process or at least create a tool to do an analysis just to assist the design and assist the rearranging of furniture and workstations. So right off the bat, um, 
I knew the script was going to be broken up into two pieces. Uh, the first one was just a simple draw your six foot diameter, your social distancing circle at the workstation or seat. The uh, second part would be the complicated, the, the logic of removing the circles and making sure it's, it's compliant. And that's where I started gravitating towards Grasshopper. Um, Dynamo, I, I felt at the time, just didn't, I, I wasn't aware of any anything that could help me at the time with it. So I was like, you know, what? I'm going to go with Grasshopper. I know there's a plugin that can, that can assist me with that. Um, but there was a, an issue. Mo a lot of our floor plans, our, our furniture plans are all in Revit. So uh, that, that kind of came up with a, a process of we're going to have to export our floor plans from Revit into uh, Rhino. And it's going to be a cumbersome process. And so that's when it was like, all right, well, let's, let's first write the script and see if we can get this to work. And we got it to work. Um, but it, and it was a short script, but it was a complicated one because it had to decide on which ones, how to remove which circle. So it had to go through multiple iterations. Um, and again, it was something that Dynamo at the time, I, I wasn't familiar that could do. Um, once we got the, the script to work, um, that workflow of exporting uh, uh, Revit floor plan as DWG and then importing them into Rhino. And then there was still like information that I still had to, had to extract uh, to use the script. So it, was, it suddenly became very cumbersome, um, importing and exporting and then actually adding that extra data. Um, it almost, we were, I felt like we were almost adding time to this. Um, so then Rhino inside, uh, I heard about Rhino inside and being able to do everything within Revit without that exporting. And this, the great thing is this is all within the Revit database that this isn't like, we're not extracting information and importing it, it's, it's simply, this is all in one program. So, and, it, and Grasshopper functions very similar uh, in, as, in this situation. So, in fact, I was able to use the same script I wrote for my Grasshopper file that worked. And with some modif modifications, I was able to, uh, able to run this. So, um, so it's very simple on just how we were able to get this to work. Um, as, uh, as you can see, I was actually able to use parameters from uh, the graphic element. Uh, and it's just like um, any other uh, uh, parameter from Grasshopper. And I'm able to uh, click on that floor plan and pull that into Grasshopper. And from the simulation, I, once I, uh, I click it and run it, it, it will draw the circles through all the seating areas and through all these multiple iterations, essentially I had to loop this data to uh, slowly simulate and filter through areas that are non-compliant. And I set up even a, a little summary to just help out the designers on, you know, what's our efficiency? How many seats are we, we removing? Which seats are safe and unsafe? But this just this potentially could save a lot of time of just exporting and importing that just is redundant. It just added time to this. Um, it was a great as it, it's a great workflow, and also it, it's um, it's something that as we work in Revit and develop it, we can just run the simulation again, and it will go through the same itera iteration. So again, there, it goes back to I don't have to deal with these two programs now. Their, their one program. Um, also, one great thing is if you're dealing with interoperability like Hummingbird or even sometimes with Dynamo, where the, uh, the object ID, um, if you delete it and you replace it, it gets rid of all your annotations. Well, with this, this doesn't get rid of your annotations. So that's one thing that I found was very valuable as if we are referencing certain certain ones of these and things change, um, they don't go away. So I it it's a fantastic tool that um, that I I think when I first heard it, I've always said it was a game changer. But to actually see this in action, it's it's really taking the benefits of of Revit 
and the benefits of Rhino and combining it into one. Um, again, this is all just, this is just one program now. And, and it's, uh, it just saves a, a, a large amount of time of hassle and not exporting or creating Excel spreadsheets and having Revit read the Excel spreadsheets to generate native geometry. It's just, you're dealing with just pure data and, uh, and how they work in between is very smooth. So, but no, I, it, it's, a, it's, a help, it's very helpful. But with that, Leland, you want, do you want to take over? Oh, I think you're, uh, you're, you're mute. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for John? I don't see any in the pane. All right, well, I will share my screen now. Oh, would you mind stop sharing, John? Awesome, thank you. Okay, you can all see my screen. So as we were going through um, looking at Rhino inside, one of the main things that we recognized was that the major advantage, one of the major advantages is that we now have access to all of the powerful grasshopper components um, directly within Revit workflows. Uh, before when often people were forced to choose between one uh, Dynamo or Grasshopper um, to, to learn. An advantage of Grasshopper was always that it had a more robust community of plugins. Um, not to say that Dynamo doesn't have some of those things, but it's just there's, there's a lot that, um, that exists in Grasshopper that are really, really useful. And now we have the ability uh, to apply them within Dynamo. So what I have shown here is an example of the Kangaroo plugin, which is a physics solver. Uh, so it does structural analysis. Um, it's part of the default uh, Grasshopper installation, but it's also a very, very powerful optimizer and a generative design tool. And I know uh, Autodesk has been um, showcasing their, uh, of course not the name escaping me, um, th but they have the, the evolutionary solver uh, plugin. Uh, which is a very powerful interface. Um, Grasshopper has other versions of that uh, similar workflow and, and Kangaroo can be thought of as one of them. So what I wanted to show here was how one of those really advanced plugins can be directly applied within Revit. So the example that we generated was following along with John's COVID-19 seat layout example. What if for some reason you wanted to not look at existing seat locations, but identify say a new seating location. So let's imagine for a second that you wanted to put as many desks as possible safely within the master bedroom of the Autodesk sample, uh, sample building file. So what we're doing here is, um, this is Rhino inside, we're loading up all the different rooms, we're selecting the room, identifying its geometry, getting the, uh, the floor outline essentially. So if I were to look at the Rhino window here, once I have this floor outline, we're then offsetting uh, the curve using actually here again, using one of these nice, um, the clipper component for Grasshopper, which if you haven't used it before, it solves a lot of the offset issues that you get from standardized components. So here's another example of us using a, uh, a pretty robust Grasshopper component to do things. So um, once we have this available surface, we are trying to populate this surface with um, points and then using Kangaroo, um, which works based on uh, constraints and objectives. So the way that this, uh, constraints that I've set up here are to say the sphere collide is essentially a circle packing constraint. And this on mesh constraint says all of those circles must remain within my boundary line that I've created. And so it'll do that for you. So if I were to play around with some of these controls we have set up, as I start with a few and I start adding more, you see it adjusts all those circles around. And at a certain point, it begins to overlap because I'm forcing too many circles in. So to make this example maybe be a little bit more clear, and this second offset um, prevents it from crossing the outer boundary. So let's use this example where I want to pack a whole bunch of circles inside. Now this is complex and is not parametrically scriptable. But using something like Kangaroo, you can very easily identify the optimal um, number 
of circles that fit within. So this could be used for um, a variety of different layout tools. But essentially, it doesn't matter. This is just one example, right? This is just to try to make the case that Kangaroo works in Rhino inside, which means that now that I have all these locations identified, I could now maybe directly place the Revit um, furniture in those locations and directly drive my Revit modeling based on very advanced uh, generative components that exist within Grasshopper. So I think that's an exciting challenge to us all to recognize, holy crap, all of the things that are in Grasshopper are now available in Revit, nearly all of them. Um, so there's a lot of, for example, machine learning components. Um, uh, Kelia is a uh, agent-based generative uh, plugin. There's a ton of really advanced stuff. So what Revit workflows do we have that to date we've said, that's not something that Dynamo can do. That's not something computational design can help with because the components haven't existed. We now need to challenge those assumptions because maybe those components exist in Grasshopper. So I really see this as opening the, the floodgates to a lot of innovation because we now can connect the tools to the problems. And the other example I wanted to show, um, so in addition to some of the advanced components, Grasshopper I think is pretty well known for its uh, visual capabilities. There's uh, the human UI plugins, just the human plugins themselves for creating uh, graphics, visualizing things. Um, not all of these are, not all of them work. Uh, so and I feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but based on our experimentation, we were not able to get human UI or aviary, which are some really nice graphical plugins that allow for um, new user interfaces and kind of pop-up windows to appear, similar to data shapes for Dynamo. Uh, and those, those plugins um, are very powerful in Grasshopper. We were not able to get all those to work, but we could get the Conduit plugin to work. So what you see here on the left, it shows up in Rhino, um, not in the Revit window, but this is simply a dashboard measuring the total number of pieces of furniture in the sample file. Again, this looks terrible. The goal is not for this to be a nice looking thing. It was quick, but what we wanted to show is that we may now have the ability to create custom data dashboards and data dashboards might be very useful within the Revit environment. So I'm sure not everyone on this call loves going through Revit schedules in order to understand the data. And if BIM, right, Revit is a huge database and we don't really have very good ways of contextualizing or understanding the data that's within it. We just have the default. Um, but maybe through Grasshopper, we have an opportunity to develop more informative or contextualized dashboards to inform our process. And although Rhino Inside currently is, in a, is a work in progress, WIP beta software, it's only gonna get better. And we expect these um, visualizing components, which were so popular in Grasshopper, it's only a matter of time before somebody makes it work in Rhino inside. So here's what we have here. Some of the issues we found, um, and this doesn't work very well when I'm on a split screen. Bear with me one second. If I were to say, go to the first level, and if I were to copy all of these chairs over, Um, I'll just tell you what's going to happen. Basically, in order for this to update, it didn't automatically update. I needed to reactivate this and then you saw the pie chart updated. So we've noticed a few little glitches like that. And depending on the plugin, uh, again, this is work in progress. Not all plugins work yet, but as you saw, a lot of them do. Um, and a lot of the core functionality is ready to rock right now. Um, I mean, you saw Kangaroo operating. Uh, I'd love to test some of the automators. That's what I call them. Uh, the iterators, the uh, Calibri type tools. Galapagos, Octopus, Design Space Explorer. There's tons of really, really powerful um, things that very likely work today. Um, but not everything. So uh, that's, that's where it stands. And uh, I guess in, in conclusion, what you saw from uh, those three different presentations today, we are able to take Grasshopper models, even from old files, bring them into uh, Revit through Rhino Inside, manipulate our geometry, build, directly build Revit native geometry um, properly, 
and uh, we have access to all of the powerful Grasshopper plugins. So we think this is a we think this is a really big deal. Are there any uh, questions about what we've shown before we jump into the the forum? All right. So uh, that concludes our uh, sort of demonstration portion of, of the event. For those of you who have attended these before, what we like to do is to begin with a some kind of lecture or demonstration as you saw today. Um, but then we really, in trying to be a forum for our community, we want to hear from everybody. We want to give everyone an opportunity to discuss some of these topics. Uh, when we did this live, which seems like a lifetime ago, um, we would always break up into so if we had 60 people at a meeting, we would all break into smaller groups at a table and talk about certain forum prompts. So this is only our second virtual event, so please be patient, bear with us while we try to do the same thing uh, virtually. So Zuby will be our moderator. Um, as it stands with Zoom, everyone on the call, I believe, uh, Lauren, feel free to correct me, uh, is an attendee. So in order for us to hear from you, and we'd love to hear from you, you need to uh, raise your hand um, so we're going to treat this kind of like an augmented panel discussion. So all the people we've heard from today will be able to unmute themselves, but unfortunately you all on the call won't be able to. So in order uh, for us to unmute you, uh, raise your hand and Lauren can unmute you for you to join. If you'd rather just type in your question and kind of, you know, not, um, not be seen or heard directly, feel free to just post that up in the question and answer. And as we have a, a nice debate about these prompts, we'll loop your questions in. Um, but again, uh, for raising your hand, all right, let's talk about how that is done. <laughs> the uh, jumping guys, where is the raise hand button? It's right below where the other buttons are. You see a raise hand. I'm gonna stop sharing. Would you like to be demoted to attendee so you can view it yourself? That's why I can't see it. Sure. Thank you, Lauren. Yep. <laughs> so all of you should be able to see the raise head button. Uh, and when that goes up, I assume Lauren will be able to see it and can unmute you so you can join. Yeah, we should, we should all be able to see it. Also, if, if you guys have questions, uh, you want to just submit them through the Q&A or the chat box, whatever is easiest for you guys, please feel free. Um, we're encouraging uh, participation of all sorts. And if y'all don't start participating soon, this is going to be a pretty short forum discussion. So if you want a continuing education credit, let's fill another 20 minutes. All right, we have a question submitted. Thank you very much. All right, so is there a document that lists many of the programs you mentioned with a brief description of its strongest points? Panelists, take it away. No, I, I personally know of. But I think that's why we have a group like this, so we can start to put things like that together um, for one another to you know, oh, this is the strength here. And again, many people use these tools differently. Um, so someone might think something else is strong, other person might prefer to use something else. So with computational tools, it's difficult to really rank, except when it's clear that, look, this, you know, don't, even though you can, is that the best way to go about it? Um, so we'll try to maybe put a list together of some sort. It's a really common question. I was actually just asked that earlier today. Someone said, hey, you have all these things, but how do I know like the ones I should know about? Yeah. And I hated not having a good answer, but it almost seemed like you can't create a dictionary of the encyclopedia, or sorry, of the internet. There's just like so much stuff out there. And so much of these uh, plugins, um, it's just that, where they're constantly being invented um, and there's no book that lists them all, except there is a uh, Grasshopper 3D does have all the plugins um, listed, uh, but that's not really how you're going to find them. Um, often I think it's through talking with other people, learning what other people's favorites are. That is a good way of figuring it out. I would also recommend if you go to uh, Food for Rhino or Grasshopper 3D, I believe you can sort the plugins based on most popular. So it's almost like an Amazon review, right? The more five stars, the higher up it goes. Just check out what the most popular ones are, the ones that have had the most downloads. And that may give you a, um, a better understanding of the most important plugins to know. Yeah. It's similar on the, on the Dynamo package side, because you will be able to see which ones have the most downloads and most use. I was going to say, I think it also goes back to, you know, the type of problem you're trying to solve. 
So uh, like the way I, for example, for example, learn is, uh, you know, I will find something that I want to do, kind of try to break it down and, you know, either, for example, some internet and that's how I learned, you know, some of the components, right? That's how I started because it's very hard, you know, to just learn all of them on your mind without actually using them. I think examples is the best way. Just looking at, you know, YouTube and and there are websites yeah. with example files. Uh, I strongly yeah. recommend um, everyone, uh, if you're interested in, for example, performance analysis, there is a website called HydraShare. So you Google HydraShare, you'll get a whole bunch of example files that leverage all of the Lady Bee, uh, Ladybug and Honeybee components. Um, Parametric Monkey has a lot of really good examples. Uh, it's not landscape forms, that's company. Um, what's the one with the, all the patterns? Um, I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll, I'll send a link in the chat. It's uh, landscape forms is a, is a lighting fixture manufacturer. Anyway, um, there, there are many, um, example files out there. Google is your friend for a lot of this stuff. Um, if you're looking for resources, um, and YouTube has a whole bunch of tutorials, uh, for anyone who's interested. And this actually might be a great spot to, uh, to, to give their pitch. We are going to give at the end, but, um, we are trying to, make the process of learning as easy as possible. Uh, there are some really good uh, essential training tutorials. We actually, Code D held a workshop recently that did a Dynamo and a Grasshopper intro. Um, and we hope to do one of those again. Uh, Lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning have a very good uh, introduction training. For those of you who have access to those websites, Performance Network is a, a more of an advanced tutorial website. But what we're finding is that there's a lot of a lot of people will learn the basics of grasshopper, but it's hard to really be effective until you master some of the more complex things like data tree and list management, which is a very unusual way of even thinking that most of us uh, who didn't have a chance to take this in school have a hard time learning. So code D is actually in the process, uh, very close to being finished with creating an intermediate grasshopper training that focuses on all the key things that we think are sort of missing in a lot of the, um, the freely available tutorials. Um, and Leland, a couple of right. our attendees have uh, uh, told us that it is generative landscapes is what you're looking for. Thank you. All right. Generative landscapes. So panelists, we've got quite a few questions that have been submitted. So I'm going to look to you guys to decide the order in which you want to answer these things. Okay. Um, and I think we can keep answering these and we will then we have um, designated prompts focused on Rhino inside, but let's, let's answer these ones first. Yeah. Um, Professor Ward had a great question. How long does it take to um, get as far as you are? How's the learning curve? How long ago did you start digging into it? Um, man, I think that's going to be different for everybody, but it definitely is. Uh, it definitely, I would say it's, it's not an easy tool to learn. It's not like learning PowerPoint or learning Photoshop. Uh, computational design is a new way of thinking. Uh, I, but the idea of, um, I mean, personally, I, I feel like it took me, a year of tinkering um, to be able to start really applying it well at work. Uh, but if we have assistance, if you're not kind of alone in the dark, but you're learning from other people, using other people's sample files, having some direction, uh, you can get started on effective things right away. Uh, what do you all think? Oh yeah, I think right for... now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ramon. Uh, I was just gonna say uh, 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 that I've been on it for like five ahead. years and I'm still learning. Uh, and now with the Rhino uh, WIP, I'm learning more about Grasshopper. But on top of that, I've been also learning other programs, other languages to augment it. So still learning, uh, but it took me about a year, uh, similar to Leland, uh, basically learning on, uh, uh, on websites because it was really no formal learning at the time. Actually, um, Professor Ward just mentioned specifically Rhino inside. Um, and I'll just answer that. I opened it for the first time, really, uh, several days ago. If you know Grasshopper, you know Rhino inside. It's just a matter of figuring out exactly which components do what. Um, and that's a continual Google searching will get you there. Yep. So I'm coming from the Dynamo side. I uh, took a, a formal class through Autodesk, uh, the Rhino WIP. Uh, so I have to learn more Grasshopper. But one of the things that I learned was it's also a conduit for Dynamo into the uh, Rhino realm too. So 
they both interact and it's kind of an interesting way of looking at how to do computational design leveraging both platforms. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Something we said was tinkering and the best way to learn it is by actually looking for a problem to solve. I think Nicola said that as well. And you're trying, you're not just, you're not learning a software. So you're thinking of, I need to approach this problem in a different way. And so the more of such problems you find, you kind of you help yourself get better. That's, that's how I learned. Surrounded by a lot of uh, just design problems and we we're trying to solve them. So. There is a question. Do you need to learn programming languages like Python, C Sharp, C++ section to be successful with computational mm -hmm. design? I, oh, yes. So to answer that question, do you need <laughs> to learn programming languages like Python? So to be a successful computational design, I will say again, it comes back to the problem you're trying to solve. Because I started out with Grasshopper, I played around with Dynamo, but you get into a problem where you can't really manage your Dynamo nodes in a way that if there's an update in Dynamo, my node might break, I have to redo it. But if I learn Python, I can write one code, regardless of any update, my code's the same. Um, so understanding, like you get, you just face different problems and you're trying to figure out how can I solve this problem? If I don't have this knowledge, then I'm trapped with my problem. Yeah. So, what is that? I say it definitely helps uh, because of the way uh, you think in programming. It really helps in uh, in visual programming. Uh, visual programming is kind of like an in between, so you don't have to learn line by line code. It actually helps you to be a visual person to do these programs, and it was driven towards for uh, visual people like architects and designers to get into programming. Uh, but if you get into the hardcore Python uh, writing where you understand how to do programming structures, that really helps you out and helps you visualize how to do the uh, visual programming. But in the long run, what I've found is the more I learn Python, the more I get away from doing visual programming. I'm almost uh, easier for me to jump into Dynamo and pop open a design script uh, window and just start plopping in code because I know the Autodesk API and I know what I want it to do. Uh, so some people don't like that, that, that get into it because they'll see it and they'll, they'll, they're looking at code. Uh, but for me, as you develop into it, it becomes easier. As you said that, Ramon, I saw everybody's videos, everyone started <laughs> nodding. I think it's, it's a good point to bring up. Um, I I would say that visual scripting is intentionally designed for non-programmers. It's, and as you get into it, it's, it's a great first step. It's like coding for beginners, honestly, and that's fine. It, it doesn't make it bad. It just makes it what it is. It's easier to accept. It's easier to get into. It's much more visual. So for visual thinkers like ourselves, like honestly, there's a reason architects became architects and not comp sci software engineers, right? people are wired differently. So for those who are wired as visual thinkers, like architects tend to be, visual scripting is a better fit. But I think what everyone was nodding about is that at a certain point, there are limitations to what visual scripting and parametric modeling in general can do. Whereas, for example, looping, very difficult in, um, in Grasshopper, incredibly simple in Python. It's a for loop. It's just yeah. part of the fundamental building blocks. So the more you learn real coding, not to disparage visual scripting, but the more you learn um, the established computer programming languages, the more you realize that they are more powerful, um, can do more things, far more flexible. And there's a whole world of software, engine software engineering um, modes for writing code that exist out there, but it's not a prerequisite. And so I would strongly encourage everyone to just jump right into visual scripting. It's a great way to learn. You learn the way of thinking. And then it's going to make it a lot easier to be successful in learning a real programming language if you ever decide to take the dive. Would you all agree with that statement? Yeah. Well, I'll just oh, yeah. Not yeah. interrupt. We can take we can take one more question and then we'll go to go to the uh, forum proper. Um, here's a specific one to Rhino inside that might be good to. Uh, answer. Will Revit and Grasshopper model remain linked if one wants to make iterations on it later? 
that's a very good question. So from what I've noticed, um, using the nodes and also depending on what you're building, you lose that node and it duplicates the element, unfortunately. Um, except like something I hard coded to actually check for duplicates and not duplicate it, it will keep creating. So that's where understanding the programmatic side of how to work with the API comes in. Because again, this is work in progress. I'm sure they will address it because you don't want it to create duplicate files, but um, it's, it's a good question. Something yeah. I've seen those in our firm do, uh, in the old days, deleting your entire model and rebuilding it would seem insane. But if it's all script, delete it, rebuild it, it's not a problem. So that's often what people will do. They'll just wipe out what was there before and replace it fresh. It depends on, so if you have like in Revit dimension lines, for instance, like sure. the moment you delete, you, you kind of lost any kind of hosting per se. I mean, technically for Rhino WIP, there is like a shake hands between the, uh, the Rhino and the Grasshopper that you open up to the uh, Revit file. Um, so when you open them up again, it remembers where the where it last uh, placed it, which is really nice in uh, in Rhino and Grasshopper because it's something that Dynamo doesn't have, especially when it crashes. Uh, but there is like a, a shake hand. But if you opened up another instance and then you started manipulating that, then it it renews the shake hand and it breaks from the previous. Great question. Great. So with that, uh, we'll get into some of the questions you have about Rhino inside. And just uh, so you guys- There's know, one more. We, sorry? There's one more. One more? Yeah. What, what is it? And we'll see if we can roll it into <laughs> a question about that. that we ask. Says, how do you quantify the time savings having developed script in design researching comparing to the time actually spent in developing the script? And then the other one, can Rhino Insight drive Revit conceptual mess? I can, I can take the last one. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one of the things that I like about uh, Rhino Insight is that I can use uh, Rhino drive a lot of geometry, uh, especially when you're doing a conceptual mass family, uh, especially like a shape of a building. So you can go into um, uh, Rhino.bip, open up a Rhino uh, file, use the geometry tools there, which is a lot easier to get some freeform shapes, and then push it into Reddit. And then you can ask, you can uh, augment that by analyzing with Grasshopper or Dynamo, uh, whichever your flavor is. But yeah, usually to play it safe as a workflow, you want to go into uh, Rhino to develop the shape in a conceptual mass family, then pull that into the project file so that it's safe. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> I think that last uh, question from Chen might uh, be able to be folded into our forum prompts. It's about uh, the time savings in uh, researching to figure out how to build a script versus once it's actually made, um, how much you have. Because I think we could talk about that so, as we yeah, decide okay. what language do you learn and such. Yeah. 